So what we have to do is, is redistribute responsibility locally and create two different forms of money. Just bear with me, I'll explain to you. One is money, which is cash, which is no credit at all. So people earn money, they can spend it straight away and, and they use it to meet their needs and the money flows around the system. And that is, that is uh, the first ledger. And it's a ledger. So everybody will know what people are earning. Now, people will say, well, minute, if it's a ledger and it's open, it's an invasion of privacy. But it's not because we want to make sure that you are being looked after. And if you're in a bed sit and, and you're, not, you're in a crummy situation and you're being abused, if people knew and it was visible, they wouldn't do it. The reason why they do it is they get away with it because no one knows. Yes, yeah, so uh, for me, the best way of explaining how uh, the system I, I'm envisaging would, would solve it is actually talking you through what I have in mind. So I, I'd recognised that, um, that everyone's confused about how banks work. It's, it's the heart of the problem. Everyone's confused. People think they've got a deposit at the bank. They think that their money is actually in a safety deposit box. It's not. Um, uh, the way it works is uh, the, you're a creditor of the bank, the bank owes you the money. Now that's fundamental because um, your money's not there. So what we, what we need to do is create a, a money ledger. It's a, it's, a, it's a digital ledger with money which is my own. It's actually equivalent of a deposit. And again, based on um, the biblical system, you pay people every day, so no credit in the system. So you, what you're going to try and create is a system where, which deals with people's needs and, and it flows. That's what cash is, is about. It should be meeting everyone's needs. And a guy called Silvio Gassel worked out that, that there are two different functions of money. One is this need to meet everyone's needs, which requires a rapid flow. And there's a separate function, which is to deal with the longer term, you know, the schools, the hospitals, the roads, which requires a credit system. And, and I agree with him that you've got to create the two separately, but you've got to create visibility because what you're saying is nobody cares. Because no visibility. You're you're a, sm a small That's person. That's certainly the impression. Oh, that's a case. No one seems no to one care. No one does care. You can't you, you can't raise a concern because no one listens. It's, it's you, you're dealing with big organisations and and you complain and no one listens effectively. So what we have to do is, is redistribute responsibility locally and create two different forms of money. Just bear with me. I explain to you. One is money, which is cash, which is no credit at all. So people earn money, they can spend it straight away and, and they use it to meet their needs and the money flows around the system. And that is, that is uh, the first ledger. And it's a ledger. So everybody will know what people are earning. Now people will say, well, minute, if it's a ledger and it's open, it's an invasion of privacy. But it's not because we want to make sure that you are being looked after. And if you're in a bed sit and, and you're, not, you're in a crummy situation and you're being abused, if people knew and it was visible, they wouldn't do it. The reason why they do it is they get away with it because no one knows. Mm -hmm. So that the key is visibility. And the other ledger is a credit ledger. And that deals with the longer term, which is what we call lending. But, but the two have to be completely separate. Now, that ledger is there to, to deal with the, the somebody. So let's say somebody is poor and hasn't got enough money to, 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 to upgrade. To the, so what would happen is they would get a loan from a local relationship manager, from a local community organization that works with them. And the loan would be would have a, a deadline. It's, it, it gets waived at the end of seven years. But the money could be used to upgrade, to give them the person what they need, effectively, to be spent on safe accommodation. And, and, and this personal relationship manager would work with you as an individual to make sure you got what you needed. And they'd also work with you to try and ensure over seven years you got repaid. But if not, the debt gets waived anyway because it, it's a book entry, and the reality is it's not going to. It's no damage. You can actually waive it. So we have, and that ledger would also be vis visible. So you have these two ledgers that everyone can see. One to make sure that everybody's needs are being met every day, and two to make the long-term projects are actually happening. And the money in the long-term ledger effectively would be used to pay workers, not not for asset prices. Not for, as I said to you before, we're not lending for asset prices or inflation. But that that actually creates problems. Use it for productive, for paying people to work, for, to do jobs that are not being done, and that will actually flow through the system. So if we create two ledgers, both being completely transparent, a cash ledger, you, all the problems that people currently have of worrying about the the banks 
wasting their money will stop because they won't be able to. So this, this is what we have to explore. Two ledgers, and I think it's a realistic solution. And again, you're only going to do it when the system collapses. But when we collapse, don't go back to the old system of allowing the same old banks to do the same old thing and you, you're a cog in the machine. As it, it's got to be real. We have to start recognising we're human beings, the planet is real, and that will only happen if we start uh, to think about things in, in, in these open, transparent terms. Morris, is, is, in your view, such a thing possible? Debt waiving, uh, uh, living in a debt-free society, yeah, debt I'm, forgiveness? I'm, I'm, I, I think so. And the reason I think so is, and I'm also referring to, to your life experiences, um, we're, we're living in the ruins of two big dreams. You know, and the, the first big dream was 1945 after the Second World War, where s state provision would guarantee a basic humanity and the decency of life. So that was the huge ex the National Health Service, um, nationalised industries, but also huge council flat building. Um, and then it <coughs> turned out that, that there was an inhumanity in that system. There was a centralisation and all these issues about mould and depredation of property were alive in that. Uh, and so then there was a, another dream, which we could call the Thatcher dream, you know, that happened in from 1979, where the privatization of these things and, and globalization, uh, and that would create energy in the system and a feedback response that would lead to better services. Um, and what we witnessed was the concentration of wealth, uh, you know, the, the right to buy turned out into landlordism, uh, dilapidation um, of estates. So in, in many ways, the, our present moment, our present political moment, it is, is a moment of unresolved broken dreams. You know, the Conservatives, you could see with Liz Truss, are still yearning to privatise. Ye and yet they know that this is, this is not the answer. You can see that my party, the Labour Party, is kind of immobilised. It doesn't want to go too far th this way, but talks a lot about a broken society and a, and, a, and a broken country. Now, what Philip's trying to do here is, is use an even more ancient dream, which is, which is something laid out in the Bible, developed, I have to say, mm. uh, very much within Catholic social thought, within Christian thinking about distributism, about decentralization, um, about the dignity of the person, about the importance of vocation, about there's a whole but what he's trying to do is bring it into the contemporary moment to address what's happening now. And what's happening now is that we haven't found any way out of these two broken dreams between the state and the market. That the market tends to centralization. This is something that's ignored to the oligarchs. We're living in this world of oligarchs of concentrations of wealth. Um, and the old state dreams is, is still has has didn't really redistribute power, didn't renew democracy and accountability. So working through this uh, biblical inheritance, I have to say quite quite remarkably um, influenced by certain Marxist ideas mm. in terms of the analysis, the concentration of wealth and proletarianization. Um, Philip is just about the only person I know who's really genuinely thinking through, well, when this crash happens, mm. how what do we do? What do we do? So, so for example, to go back to your housing issue, Philip saying that when the crash comes, it shouldn't be paid by the poor, that we should have a property redistribution mm. rather than a bailout of the banks. Mm. So if you're in a property and you can't and you lose your job and you can't afford to pay your mortgage, you're endowed the house. You're not evicted from the house. I mean, that's if you're in a rented property and the thing falls, you can't be evicted. You you stay in your place and you have the redistribution. And then he's pointing out that the banking system itself, due to its volatility, due to its greed, due to, due to its manipulation of the market, um, there has to be forms of accountability within that. So, so that's why he's talking about this two-ledger system. That, and then at the end of this seven-year cycle, the debt is forgiven. So well, there's not happened a... historically. We've forgotten the history. They actually, that's the way it worked. The kings would actually, when it came to power, would waive the debts because it was because they were looking after the people, and the kings had the power to waive the debts, and, and they waived on their birthdays. We've just forgotten, and, and we just we moved to a creditor based system, yeah, but and, the, and we've forgotten but what this, used to happen. You need is, to look after the people. But this is the argument I'm addressing. Mm. 
So what I'm saying is the fantasy at the moment is to think that this system can continue as it is. It's 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 volatile. We are witnessing um the birth pangs of I think we're seeing of, it falling of, apart. Of falling, aren't we? we're falling seeing apart. It, absolutely. Um but what's being offered politically that isn't just a reversion mm. to what was before. So try and view this in, in some way with this idea of the five masters and the and and the idea um, of these civic trusts rather than nationalised models where local people own their energy supply, where it's accountable to local assemblies. So the old dreams that are being restored here are ancient Greek dreams mm. of uh, of accountability and local assemblies. Yeah. That's that's one side to restore a sense of responsibility in physically located places. Um, that's another thing that that's going on. Uh, and then to understand um, credit, banking, and money as humanly created institutions that should be amenable to human control. Mm. So my response to your question, how feasible is this, is what's unfeasible is to carry on as we are. And what we're genuinely trying to do is present a practical program of reform so that when the moment comes, this is the fear that I think inhabits Philip's imagination, is that the banks crash and we bail them out again. And everything is... Or, or, or even worse, which I think is what is being planned, is the central banks will say, we don't want three or four big banks. We only want one central bank, and the central bank will actually control our lives. It'll be dystopian. That will be completely the opposite. It's going back to Soviet Russia. That's what you're ending up with if you're not careful. And that's what a CBD, a central bank digital currency is. We want the opposite. We want thousands of community banks building relationships with local and, communities. And this is, this is hugely important. So... It's just to understand that the, the state has grown in power, whatever has happened. The market has grown in power, whatever. And we've seen a disintegration of the social, of society. Well, that's what Margaret Thatcher said, uh, forecast, didn't she? Yeah. Uh, back it's, in the 80s, she, she, she said. And we, we've now seen the disintegration of community. Yeah, and family um, and community. Yeah, everything so, family's but can gone. the covenant, how does the covenantal approach restore that sense of uh, social cohesion between, say, parties who are have estranged interests from each other? Well, that, that's, the role of, that's the role of democracy mm. and mutual interests. Mm. So what we're saying is, is that because of the centralization of capital in the state, everything has become a matter of national. But if you redistribute power, pardon me, if you redistribute power, um, then it comes amenable to human negotiation. So the reconciliation of the estranged interests goes on in local places where there is a mutual interest in civic peace. There is a mutual interest in a, in a shared prosperity. There is a mutual interest in functioning local institutions. And the insight that I think Philip has that is central is that money is a means of creating relationships, not of destroying them. So yeah. under capitalism, money becomes just a means of dissolving relationship through individual self-interest and when the state controls the money it's individual citizens but within philip's model is that if you keep people company along the road if you, you if you view equity or credit or whichever word you want to use as a means of re-establishing relationship then the most urgent work that we need is to reconstitute civil relationships in society and that can only be done in a decentralized way so i'm just opening up that yeah. this is what's underlying all this and the answer to your question is there is what we're living through is what's called technically an interregnum it's a period between I, times i came across it in your book <laughs> yeah yes, i thought it was very interesting uh, and that interregnum is by no means resolved so the, the important quote is from an Italian Marxist called Gramsci, who said mm. that the old, is, the old is dead, the new cannot be born. There's a fraternization of opposites and all manner of morbid symptoms pertain. So this is our world. Yeah. Um, but the price of a successful politics is a constructive alternative. And this space that, that you're building here is that constructive alternative more vivid than anywhere else that I can locate.